Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, October 3rd, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from The Woman King, editor Terrilyn Shropshire. I mean, there was not a mold for which this film would fit into. It wasn't like anything else I had ever read. You know, this is our history, which we don't get to often tell. Not certainly on this level. And so if the studio is going to give us the opportunity to do that, we better get it right. I kind of surround myself with little quotes, things that kind of inspire me, like what if. What if is the thing that's in front of me at all times, because that's really what you're doing most of the day. Yes, all that and a lot more in this edition of The Rough Cut. Okay, hey kids, Matt Fury here. Thank you for coming over to check out the podcast today. Very excited for this one, because we get to visit with someone we haven't talked to in over two years. And that is just way too long when it comes to this editor. Yes, I am speaking of the amazing Terrilyn Shropshire. I think the last time we spoke with her was a little over two years ago, I believe. And that was for her film, The Old Guard. That film, as is the film we're talking about today, was directed by Gina Prince-Bythewood, someone Terry has been collaborating with for over 20 years. In fact, Terry edited Gina's feature film directorial debut, Love and Basketball. And here's a fun fact for you. Tara Lynn Shropshire also edited the directorial debut of Casey Lemons, and that film would be Eve's Bayou. So if you're keeping score, Terry was the editor behind the films that launched two very impressive directing careers. And I think I mentioned that to Terry when we talked about The Old Guard, um, and I also think she may have just shrugged it off as a coincidence. But I think that says a lot about Terry as an editor and also as a collaborator. Anyway, Tara Lynn Shropshire is back with us today to talk about her new film with Gina, The Woman Gang. Lots of positive response to this one with critics and at the box office. And as someone who has seen the film, it is definitely an appropriate response to a really great movie. A movie we will discuss with the super talented editor who made it. And we will talk to Terry about all that in a few moments. First, I just got to give some time to the people who helped sponsor this talk with Terry. This Terry talk. Terry talk. I like that. Forget that TED talk crap. Terry talk is the way to go. And the way to go the next time you need the best in production audio for your movie, directorial debut or not, is to visit the musical geniuses at Extreme Music. Since 1997, that's not too long ago, is it? Please tell me it's not. Let's just say for a little while, they have been the ones film and TV makers have turned to for the very best in production audio. Music to set the mood, establish the time period, drive the action, punch up lame performances. There's no lame performances in The Woman King, but music is everything. It creates context and tension and momentum and so much more. So get on over to ExtremeMusic.com for your next project and dig into their vast catalog of music from the best of the best. All you got to do is a quick and easy keyword search on things like instruments, genre, speed, vocals, era, mood, composer, any little details you have in mind for your story. You can get your tracks in different links with whatever instrumentation you need. You can even search for music that sounds like a reference track you give to them. All of that power in one simple-to-use website where you can do all of the licensing online or get a little help from one of their reps at an office nearest to you. So the next time you need the best production audio out there, check out ExtremeMusic.com. Okay, making her triumphant return to the rough gut. So glad to have her back. Here's the Woman King editor, Terrilyn Shropshire. When we see each other at the Eddies this year, we're just going to be like, we're not going to be holding up anything but our heads. How about that? <laughs> so we're here to talk about you and your wonderful new movie. I would love to hear you describe the film. When people ask you about The Woman King, what do you tell them? I tell them that it is a historical epic that centers around the Agogia of the Dahomey Kingdom in 1823. And it uh, tells the story of their role in the kingdom and who they were as warriors, as women, as Africans. And uh, that's kind of how I describe it. Well, when people describe films, I mean, this is a common thing. When somebody asks you about a film, you give them points of reference. Like, what's this movie about? Oh, it's like Star Wars meets Conan the Barbarian. It's like Blade Runner meets Notting Hill. And with The Woman King, you know, I, I certainly heard reference films brought up. And in watching the film, I could definitely draw parallels in the training montages. You have the combat set pieces. You have a build up to this climactic battle. But I couldn't compare this film to any other film because I could not think of another film that featured women of color in this context. So it really felt to me like you all were almost creating a new point of reference for future filmmakers. And I'd just like to hear your take on that. Yeah, really glad that you said that. And that's often how I felt as well. I mean, there was not a mold for which this film 
would fit into. And I know that very early on, um, from the most first moment that Gina told me that she had her next project to when I read the script, it wasn't like anything else I had ever read. And I certainly hadn't seen these type of warriors written that way. And what I loved about the script and ultimately the film that we made was that it went into seeing our history in a way that I don't think we've ever been able to see it, especially as it reflected the empowerment of women and where women, the role of women in that particular time. And so that gave me a profound sense of responsibility to get it right. It's almost like, you know, you're, you're telling the story of your ancestors and that we were not victims and that we had agency and we were warriors. And I think that historically that's been taken away or at least certainly tried. And so we did feel we were doing something special. And of course that presented its challenges because anytime you're doing anything different, it's not always easy to take that journey through a system that tends to want to define a film a certain way, right? And I felt that this was a really hard film to define in a good way. We wanted it to feel different. We wanted to have these great badass action elements of the movie, but we also really wanted to show the humanity of these women and who they were as women in the sisterhood and, and what that army might have felt like. So I think in your answer, you used the words profound responsibility. And I'm glad you did, because I have to be honest and say that knowing how big this movie was going to be, in a lot of ways, this is, in the air quotes, an important movie. And I knew going in, it was going to be a very good movie. The caliber of the talent that was working on it, the early reviews that were coming out about the film, I mean, the buzz was incredible. But still, there was a part of me that had a concern that it wouldn't work as well as it should, and ultimately as well as it did, because a lot of times these important films, sometimes the, the filmmakers lose focus under the weight of that responsibility. And what's sacrificed is story and character and just the pure entertainment of the audience. And the performances were incredible. The characters were nuanced. And again, I think that's probably where a lot of films fall down when they have this extra responsibility. You know, maybe it's not a fair comparison, but just comparing something like working on the old guard versus working on the woman king. How did that feel any different for you, that added weight of this film? Yeah, I think that, you know, the old guard, when we say everything prepares us for what's next, I think the old guard definitely reflects what Gina's intention is when she's doing action, which is it needs to be character driven. And so before I talk about the differences, I think the similarities in that was that it was very important in establishing the characters of the old guard, especially being the first one, that we gave the audience excitement and thrill and action, but that we allowed them to imprint on the characters within the old guard. And so in many ways, this movie was no different in the sense that by the time you got to the big battle scenes within our film, we wanted you to make sure that the audience felt connected to each one of those characters and that there was something at stake. And so I think the difference with respect to this film, The Woman King, was there was a little bit, I think, of a deeper dive into the characters, their history, their vulnerability, but also the layer of the complicated time at which this movie is set. I mean, this movie was deliberately set in 1823 because the kingdom was at a crossroads with respect to the enslavement of other Africans and how that was portrayed in the film. I think that the other thing with respect to this one was the relationship of Naniska as the lead warrior and as someone who you could say that she and Andy have a certain type of leader quality. But I think with Naniska, there's something deeper that you that you find out about the film, I mean, about her character. And so I felt like with this one, there was the layer of the actual world building, which was, again, the period of 1823 Dahomey, which I had to kind of navigate within certain scenes, how much, how overt did you want to be with that? And how much of it was organic? There were the relationships between 
these characters and what each one of them had at stake. They all had their own history in terms of who they were as warriors. So there was that layer. And then there was just the layer of telling the story, just the keeping it, you know, this kind of propulsive type of energy, but also balancing the more intimate notes with them. And it was just all of that on a much larger epic scale. So I felt as far as the responsibility, you know, this is our history, which we don't get to often tell, not certainly on this level. And so if the studio is going to give us the opportunity to do that, we better get it right. Because if we don't, there is this feeling that they'll be less likely to give someone else that opportunity the next time. So that's part of it too, is, is that I worked with Gina now for 20 two years. And we have evolved together as filmmakers and and, uh, as collaborators. And when you get a story like this, and someone is going to give you the opportunity to tell it, you better do it right, because they're very rare. And it takes a big fight to get these stories up on screen. And you also recognize that you can do all the work and you just don't know if people will come and see it. And that's what's been also incredible about this experience is that people are going and telling their friends and going and seeing it a second time and a third time, which is, you know, a little scary. <laughs> it's like now they're really going to go deep diving into the film. Well, thankfully, you did get it really right. And it is a very enjoyable film. Thank you. You mentioned reading the script and just being moved by that and the power of that and the importance of being able to tell your story. What did you discuss with her when you read that script? You know, we just discussed actually the distinction of the characters. I think when you first read a script or, 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 and you're getting familiar with the characters, basically having a sense of who they are as individuals. I mean, you had characters like Naui and Fumbe and Azogi and Ode and, um, and Naniska. And, and, and there's a lot of, so there's a lot of characters that, you know, you realize when you're reading the script, you take a little bit more time to, get a sense of who everybody is, right? And yet you know that when that translates to film, you'll have the physical presence of the actor that will embody that character. And at the same time, you know, it's important that the audience kind of doesn't get lost in who am I following here? You know, there's always the question of whose story is it, right? I have that question on here. Well, you know, it's interesting because on this one, you could argue, you know, there will be people that will watch it and say, oh, this is Naniska story. Right. And then there might be some people that will watch and go, no, this is Naui's story. And then there will be people who will be more connected to Azogi because of who her character is, which frankly I love, you know. And in many ways, yes, it's very Naniska driven. It's Viola's character. And at the same time, it is an ensemble piece. And I think that you can find a little bit of yourself in every character. So within the script versus the film, it was just being able to discuss how each character has their own, again, I use the word agency within the, within the larger scope of the story. And then it's always fun, Matt, when you read a script and the line is, and they go into battle. <laughs> and, it's like, and then it ends up being like a, you know, eight minute battle scene or whatever that is. So that's always fun, especially when you're looking at even the length of a script. It's like they, they always have things like, not in this one, but the love scene, right? And then it's like they make love and it's one line. And then suddenly it's like a three or four minute extravaganza. Parenthetically, it says, you'll figure it out, Terry. Yeah, you'll figure it out. And don't worry about the time. Well, that's a good note to get. Don't worry about the time. Speaking of time, last time we spoke was in 2020 about the old guard. When did Gina approach you with this project? And give me the timeline of when you were working on the film. We were sitting in the old guard editing room and she said, I think I have our next movie. And of course, immediately your adrenaline kind of goes up and you're, you know, and, and, and you wonder, okay, what gauntlet am I going to, you know, get thrown down on this one? So what ended up happening was they started shooting November 1st. You know, the minute I, Gina has a project, I'm kind of in it, whether it has to do with helping her put together a presentation or certainly with this one. Often when Gina does the early tests, like hair and makeup and that type of thing, we'll put together a presentation even before any other film is shot. So I get involved early in whatever, you know, she needs. And sometimes it's just, you know, minor things. It's, you know, looking at storyboards, starting to look at the stunt business, 
bringing that stuff in the Avid so that if there's something within a presentation that needs to be created. So I traveled over to Cape Town because we were in Cape Town, South Africa for about almost five months. So I moved over there, I think the last week in October around there. And they started shooting. And uh, the first scene that Gina shot was the actually the first scene in the movie, which was the entrance into the village. So she just decided, okay, she's just going to go for it <laughs> for the first first scene. So we were there from November to uh, November, December. There was a Christmas break. There was a certain point where they did take a hiatus because Omicron was starting to tick up in South Africa. And I think everybody was a little worried that nobody wanted to get shut down. And so they kind of shut down so that we wouldn't get completely shut down. But during that time, I got to keep editing, which was great because it allowed me to kind of catch up with all the footage that was coming in. And then we wrapped up around the end of February, first week of March, and came back to Los Angeles to do the rest of the editing. We started a little bit, I started, or I should say, I finished my first cut at home. We kind of quarantined for a couple of weeks. Our editing rooms weren't quite ready for us. And then we all moved in and, and got to work. You know, Gina needed to give me a little bit more time to get a first cut out on this one. So I think we probably started cutting together around the second week in March, something like that. Well, I just have to comment on something you said, and that was, Gina said to me, I think I have found our next movie. And I think that's where every editor hopes to get to at some point is to have that kind of relationship. Absolutely. I mean, I feel very, very lucky. You know, I never take it for granted. I always hope that I will get that call. I have another movie that I want you to be a part of. It's a gift. And it's come with a lot of hard work and sweat. And there's no crying in editing, but uh, I'll say... Uh, <laughs> Uh, tears. But no, it's, I, I think we've talked about this before. I think what's really wonderful, if you can find these type of relationships, is to work with filmmakers who kind of take you along in their evolution. And when Gina gets to stretch herself as a director, I get to stretch myself as an editor and pull out new tools and really show what we're both capable of doing. And then sometimes uh, we our paths have crossed with I you know I've I've gone between in the past Gina and Casey and lately they've been on the same kind of parallel path so I haven't gotten to work with Casey recently and she's been working with some really great editors who I love like Wyatt Smith and she's working with Daisha Broadway right now who I'm a big fan of but what's great too is is that you grow as people and you go in and out of your lives and. You know, you, you kind of experience life and then you come back and you're different people, not different people, but you've matured and things have happened and you bring that s stuff into your art. And I think that's the way it should be. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the practical aspects of your job. What is the basic setup that you require in your editing room? How do you like to set up your editing room so that I'm going to be comfortable here being creative for four to five months? Well, what I first like to set up on a larger scale is how I'm interacting with the director. That's ultimately, without I get into the specifics of the equipment, I always look at the room space when I'm going into an editing room because I like to have an interaction with the director where we're kind of side by side. I think early in my career, I tend to have the, the director a little bit behind me, a little bit to the side. And um, I found myself kind of turning around a lot. And then I got really inspired by other editors and actually talking about how's your room set up or how are you? And, and at one point, I think I was looking at, at some article where it was, I think, I don't know if it was Walter Merchant Coppola. And there was a, I think there needs to be a whole architectural digest about editing rooms, frankly. So ultimately, I look at the space because I want to I wanna make sure that we spend a lot of time in that room. I want to be able to kind of communicate. And then I always then look at, okay, the throw of the mom, like that kind of stuff. And then for my own personal corner of the world in the editing room, I just like to have my hydraulic desk, you know, my three monitors, my mixer, you know, my keyboard. And I love my little one that lights up. And then I kind of surround myself with little things. Usually they're quotes, you know, things that kind of inspire me, like dwell on the possibility or what if. Those type, what if is the, the thing that's in front of me at all times? What if? Because that's really what you're doing most of the day. And then the lighting, I like to have control over dimming and mood and space. 
I like to be able to, we have left, center, right for me, left, center, right for her in the monitor. I rarely ever look at her side of the room with respect to watching the film. I'm always kind of looking in front of me and often in a very old school movie, Ola kind of way at the smallest. I mean, I still remember, again, I got to work with Walter Mersch back in the day when I was an assistant for one day, one day, but it was cool. That's quite a day. Yeah, it was quite a day. But I remember him having his little people in front of the monitor and the whole spatial relationship. And I still think about that. So yeah, it's a very, I don't have a lot of bells and whistles. I'm not a bells and whistles type of editor. I, I kind of use my little turbo mouse and but it gets the job done, Matt. <laughs> it's all that matters. I do wish, though, I could plug in the matrix sometimes and, and have a little bit more. Um, I don't know what technical thing I, I should be using. I, I'm sure there's something great that I'm like, at some point, I'll, I'll go into somebody other's editing room and go, why am I not using this? But um, right now, it's, it's working for me. I think you've got along just fine without whatever that is. <laughs> but um, I, I hope you find it. Thank you. Let's go back to the world building aspect of this, because mm -hmm. you as you brought up, there's a certain amount of education and context setting you have to do for the audience. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk about some of the choices you made in doing that. First would be the title at the beginning, describing all the things you talked about, Dahomey and what's going on in 1823, where they are. And mm -hmm. I find that in discussions with the editors, it seems like those things are actually the last thing that get developed because you're not exactly sure what needs to be spelled out in that setup. Uh -huh. So was that something that was always scripted or did it evolve at all during post-production? Yes, it was in the script. And we talked a lot about at the beginning, how are we going to take those words and put them on the screen in such a way that it was different. We experimented with a little bit of trying to maybe start the actual visuals in Fong Bay, which is the language, uh, and then have it kind of then switch over to English, but at the same time, almost reverse, like have the vocal person maybe start in Fong Bay and you'd see it in English. We tried a, a couple of different options to possibly do it that way. We talked about visually, what do we maybe want to put underneath it? And we kind of went back with, may, at one point we had talked about maybe doing something very abstract, like make the making of the machetes or something. And then at the end of the day, we went back to keep it, keeping it simple. And the dialogue itself, well, what's up on screen, changed a little bit. It got a little bit longer with respect to kind of having a little bit more explanation as far as what was really at stake and, and making sure that, that there was a little bit more detail in that. And then what was great was the vote, you know, then the question became who was going to be the voice. And at a certain point, we decided because Amenza is really the spiritual leader of these women, she would be the one that would tell the stories to the others or tell, tell the story of the Dahomey, tell the story of the Goje. Uh, so we had Sheila do it. And it was really, we initially did it kind of to have it for our temp. And it just sounded so great and so right. We knew that Sheila was going to be the voice of the entrance into the movie, who plays Amenza, by the way, Sheila Aiton. The dialogue was something I did want to ask you about, and I thought it was fascinating how you handled it. Rather than do subtitles, you went sort of the, the Hunt for Red October route, where English is spoken, even though the characters are not native English speakers. And then at a point in the film, we meet two characters from Brazil, and they're speaking Portuguese to each other. Uh -huh. But then when they're talking to the king of Dahomey, they start to speak to him in Portuguese, which I think he understands. But then he tells them... Speak to me in my language when you're in my palace. And so then they all speak English. Uh -huh. So I would just love to know the broader thinking behind how you would handle language between all these characters. Yeah, well, that really came from obviously early discussions with Gina and how they wanted to kind of, uh, they, they knew it would be challenging to have a situation where everybody was speaking Fon, especially given that if you think about even the different tribes and how that might even go into play if you really were trying to be that authentic with respect to the language. And so in many ways, it was decided very early on that, yes, they would speak English, that there would be some degree of a dialect, but not everybody had to be kind of locked into that because even within the dialect of speaking the English, it would be conceivable that people would have come to this kingdom, certainly if you were a Goji from different tribes. And so that was something that was, I think, taken into consideration. You know, the Portuguese, Gina always felt that 
when we went into Weta, which is a different environment than going into Dahomey in the palace, that these men, and even though Malik, played by Jordan Bolger, is not a slaver, he comes in with his friend, who is Santo, played by Hero Fine Stephen, who is a slaver, and being able to kind of bring that colonial aspect into the film in such a way that the audience would take notice that these men were coming in to this African country speaking a different language, which I thought was, was a, a really interesting approach that Gina wanted to take. And I, and I really commend her for doing that because I think there would be this inclination to just have them speaking English. But it also starts to show you a little bit of the contrast when the character of Santo has, has met Gezo before. And that you see, you know, the king is also, he is a educated king. He is wise. Obviously, there has been a connection between the king and these particular men before. And I think that language, that sense of knowing that Gezo has also learned Portuguese as part of his involvement is a layer that is also was very deliberate. And yet being able to remind the audience as well as the character that, yes, he is still king and you are in his kingdom and that he is someone to be respected was the whole purpose of reminding Santo exactly where he is, despite his intentions. You had talked about Gina just sort of jumping in with both feet and doing that first scene of the film where they're attacking some people that we don't know who they are. We don't, we don't know the context of why they're leading this assault. And I think that was sort of the approach you took throughout the film that things would be explained later. Aniska leads this assault and we don't know why, but and they're very successful at leading it. But then you realize they're liberating slaves. And I thought that was a really interesting approach throughout is that you sort of led with action and then came in with context. Am I completely off base in that? Or is there some conscious effort on your part to handle it that way? Yes, you're very, very intuitive as usual, Matt. Oh, that thanks. was absolutely the attention. I think that as an editor and as someone who works with a writer director, the ability to allow an audience to discover, not to lead them by the hand from the very beginning and tell them how to think and how to feel, but allow them to make those discoveries to me is the best type of filmmaking. It's the type of fil filmmaking that I love as an audience member. And I, I really feel that this was something that on this particular film, allowed the audience actually to connect more with the characters as opposed to, again, trying to manipulate and, and manipulate's a strong word. I mean, as an editor, we are the director of the eye. We are a little bit of the puppet master, right? But you, you want to involve your audience in the journey and not have to explain everything at the beginning and let them come to their own conclusions. It's interesting that you talk about this because in the script, originally, the way that Naniska and the Agoji warriors were introduced was you actually, the women that you see at the hut at the end when Amenza pulls down the drape and you see these women in this hut who have been captive, there was initially a opening where you started with them, where you saw these women and they were afraid and they were basically trapped. And then as we started to work on the scene, there was something incredibly powerful with just starting with these women rising out of the grass. Because immediately you kind of sit up and you go, whoa, what is this? What is about to happen? And you start asking questions, which I think is a great thing. And that's what you want to do as an audience. You want wonderment. And so I think that in changing that scene around a little bit, we were able to give the audience a little bit of wonderment from the very beginning. And then at a certain point, they began to then learn that these were not just women coming in to annihilate a village. They were coming into a village to save their people. And when you look at those two scenarios, there's one where you're going to connect a little bit more on a human level with a character. I think you really hit on what I was trying to get to at the beginning about sometimes the bigger films lose focus. The way you expressed it, trust in your audience, I think that's exactly what you did and what sometimes when a film doesn't work, it's what they don't do. So um, that was a great way to put it. You are no stranger to action movies. In The Woman King, there are these beautifully choreographed action sequences that move very fluidly between the characters. 
The camera is moving in and around the combatants, almost doing a handoff from one fight to another fight. So it seems like that you would be inclined to, and I think you did, stay wide more often and let it breathe more in situations like that. Yes, absolutely. The fact that these actors trained as long and as hard as they did to do their own stunts, to be physically present was remarkable. And to see those dailies come in and see the power and strength and work that was done to embody those characters, all I wanted to do was to, again, you become an audience member. As an editor, I never stop being the person who's watching and, and experiencing. And for me, I wanted to be able to show all of that, to show how powerful these women were, um, smart, agile, and then with the actors actually showing us that, doing that, um, it really gave me the opportunity as an editor to stay on shots and to not have to be unnecessarily cutty, for lack of a better description, with the action. I enjoyed watching them moving through. I enjoyed watching their aggressive interaction, their speed, just the physical movement of these warriors and the actors embodying these warriors. So that part of it was really fun to be able to do that and not have to cut around anything. I mean, not to say, look, my job, obviously, and responsibility is to make sure that each one of those women, I'm leaving the best of their work in there. And so it took a lot of time and watching over and over again certain movements and deciding when to, how long to stay in a movement, how long to stay in a particular piece of conflict. So that when it finally got to you on the big screen, you could enjoy that too. And you could see that there wasn't a bunch of stunt people I was trying to cut around because it was actually those actors doing the work. And Gina, you'll hear it in many interviews, Gina talks a lot about this film for her. Her intention was to make it intimately epic. And so that you have these large, obviously you got the scope and you felt the presence of where you were in the time and the space. And yet there was an intimacy to not only the quiet moments, but also the battle moments. And I think that the battle scene that most reflects that in many ways is the fight between Oba and Aniska when she finally confronts him, when, she, when they go to Weta after the tribute. That was a fight that ultimately was very, very emotional driven. Yes, it's a physical fight, but it's a physical fight that is driven within the way that she's fighting, which is uncharacteristically not how Naniska fights. It was emotional driven, given their relationship, which I'm not going to ruin in this podcast. Well, don't do it in any podcast. Any podcast. <laughs> when Naoi first goes into this new world, she goes into the palace. It's the part of the palace where no men are allowed. And it's a really vibrant place with soldiers training and people laughing and doing their day-to-day -day activities. And it's a different world for her. Her eyes might be open to this world for the first time, but it's her ears that really tell the story for the audience. And as she walks through this courtyard, you know, we're hearing much more than she's seeing and being immersed into this new world with her. And I'd just love to know about your approach to the sound design of that, because there is so much going around us at that time to really build this world. Yeah. And that was what was really lovely about ultimately, you know, getting to the space where we were actually in the, on the stage. And we got on the stage very early on in this process. Not we, Obviously, it wasn't just the final mix. It was, um, you know, just even having early elements the first time I showed it to Gina, preparing for friends and family, preparing for um, director's cuts, preparing for audience previews, and just being able to gradually just continue to build and add and create that immersive experience. With respect to the first time Naui goes in to the barracks of the Agoje, which is one of my favorite moments in the film. And it was one of the first things that I showed Gina actually when she was shooting, because Gina doesn't like to really watch cut footage when she's directing. It kind of distracts her in many ways, but I wanted her, and it was actually on uh, Martin Luther King Day, I wanted to give her something as almost a little gift of, you know, Martin Luther King Day. So I took that scene and I built it and I found a piece of music and I literally sent it to her and I said, happy King Day. 
And the thing about that particular scene is, as someone who as loves movies, for me, that scene was the first time you go into Hogwarts. It's Alice going down the rabbit hole. You know, it, it is that character when we're following a character who is our hero, heroine, or the person who is taking us through a movie to some degree. I wanted it to feel as magical as that, like anything that she could have imagined, cutting off the heads of people and putting them in cauldrons and that these women were, you know, had a certain kind of energy to them. And then she comes in and she sees connection and sisterhood and things that she as a, as a young woman has never experienced. And so it was really important for that to feel warm and visceral and that you definitely hear the environment from the, even the moment she leaves her father and she comes in and she hears the clanging of the, of, of the women fighting. And, and there's obviously a fascination with that because that's what has been in her imagination. You know, the showing the cauldron. Oh, what's that? You know, and but then when you go into the actual home where they live, it has takes on something different. And then we get all that right and kind of in the in the pocket. And then the most incredible thing happens, which is Terrence Blanchard comes in, and he creates a piece of score for that moment. And then all of it's just the big cherry on top. And and that's the fun thing about when. You, you create something as, as an editor, and then every single person that comes alongside you um, just takes it to the next level. Now, is this a reunion for you and Terrence Blanchard of sorts? I mean, I know you worked together early on a fair amount. I don't know if you've worked together recently. Um, I, I guess I should be a better note taker than that. But um, tell me about working with Terrence. Yeah, this was... Uh, this was our sixth project, though I feel like I'm missing one. I mean, it was so funny because recently we we kind of were together and we're like, is this six or is this seven? And because part of it kind of crosses over into a little bit of TV as well. So we're saying right now it's six, but there might be a hidden seventh that we'll come up with at some point. And again, what's great about when you have that kind of ability to weave in and out of each other's lives and Terrence goes off and does operas and, and amazing scores for other people. And then you sit him down and you show him the early version of, of a movie. And he feels so inspired to create what he did create. It's fun. And I love Terrence to death. He's one of my favorite people on this planet. And yet I'm still in awe of him at times because of just his ability to do what he does we can always argue that he doesn't know how, what I, he doesn't understand how, how I do what I do. And I feel the same way. I have that mutual respect for him, but it works. And he's just such a open type of composer when it comes to working with not only the director, but also with me. And, you know, because Gina had decided very early on that Terrence was going to be the composer on this movie, which is great when you know going in who's going to be composing. And you can start having those early connections and early discussions and as to and then you can you can start showing things earlier and allow him to start to kind of get his wheels churning. So in that theme of openness and collaboration and just sort of knowing each other well, but not really knowing how each other does what they do so well, what is that actual collaboration like between the two of you practically in the actual production process? Well, much like you said at the beginning. There was no roadmap for this film, even musically. And even though we knew that Terrence was going to be on from the beginning, trying to build a temp score for this film to get us through friends and family, director's cut, audience previews, until we actually started implementing Terrence's actual score was one of the hardest films that Gene and I had to try to tempt. It was so difficult. And part of that was because we knew that there would not be anything that was going to sound like what Terrence was going to want to create for this. So it really was a challenge for myself. And we had uh, two music editors who worked on the film, Louis Schultz, who worked with Terrence before, and Del Spiva, who you know we've worked with numerous times before 
who really had to kind of go in and find pieces that could suggest maybe rhythmically or within African instrumentation, the type of energy we might want to present going into all of these screenings, but also be extremely careful about not using something of Terence's past films that would not really reflect the intention of the movie. Because often what can happen is if you start using a composer's score from other movies, there is the danger that those people that are watching the film, especially within the executive ranks of a studio or people who are going to have something to say, who are going to have an opinion about the score, even in its temp form, you don't want to create an environment where they have an impression on the music that doesn't really reflect what the composer is going to do. It's sometimes easier to use a different composer, a different score that has nothing to do with Terrence within a temp situation so that it gives our composer, this in this case, Terrence, the freedom of not being judged based on something that he's done in the past that has nothing to do with the movie that we're making now, if that makes any sense. So we were very careful in that respect um, because we wanted to give Terrence the ability, the freedom, and, and not be in a situation where the film is being judged on a piece of music that he might have composed for Red Tails or for Black Klansmen or for Inside Man, which is not what this movie is. So you brought up doing the friends and family and then the audience previews. What did you learn from doing those previews? What sort of feedback did you get? We learned that there was a lot of love for this film, certainly. And we learned that in many ways, the sisterhood on this film was the thing that the people most connected with. They connected with the Naui and the Niska storyline, as you can imagine, and they really connected with the sisterhood of these women. And people loved the action, which was great. But what was even better was knowing that they appreciated the fact that we gave, we took time for them to get to know who these people were. And that was something that they didn't necessarily feel they always had the ability to do in films like this. I think that was one of the biggest and most affirming things that was great. I think that we had a little bit more Naui storyline early on where you really kind of, when she says, I didn't have an easy life, you got to see a little bit more of her life at the beginning, her kind of toiling and, and, and basically taking care of the family that you don't really get to see too much of anymore in the beginning. And early on, there was a feeling from our, certainly from our friends and family, that they imprint on Naui very quickly and that they maybe didn't need as much of, of that, that they wanted to kind of get to her life within the Agoji a little bit sooner. So some of that stuff went away a little bit, um, which people will be able to see back in the deleted scenes because we are going to do extended version. So it was that kind of thing. I think that um, navigating a little bit of the Naui relationship with Malik was interesting to get feedback on because, again, people liked that relationship, but they also felt that they were connected more with the women. You know, Gina wanted to make sure even a character like Malik, who's taking his own personal journey to discover who he is as a man and coming back to his mother's homeland, making sure that we kept his arc, but also modulating that relationship so that people felt that we were still staying in line with the relationship between the women. So those are the kinds of things that come through when you start opening it up to the people you trust in terms of their feedback. There's that word trust again. Yeah. I believe when we started the discussion today, you mentioned this 20 plus year journey you've been on with Gina and evolution as, as an artist and as a filmmaker. In your experience from doing The Woman King, what have you learned? Your approach to your craft or actual technique or process, whatever, whatever it may be, what have you learned from doing The Woman King? That's a really introspective question. I think I'm still processing, to be perfectly honest, Matt, on that one. I think that... Um, there's a certain point where you get to a stage in your career where on one hand, you're always working to improve the discipline and to improve, I always say honing your skill. And yet there's also a certain point when you really 
kind of recognize and you can celebrate what your strengths are and, and, and you can celebrate where you are as an editor. And there's a confidence in that. And I felt in going through this film, we really knew what we were doing. And I, and I, I mean, I know that sounds a little conceited and I don't mean it to sound like that, but it, it was one of those things where, you know, it, this was a hard film and it wasn't just hard because of the sheer amount of footage that was shot or figuring out how to get it all done because you figure that out. That's, that's the job. But knowing that you could get through it isn't something you can always feel when you're young, you know, early in your career. And I find in talking with young editors, and I literally just, um, I went over to, um, I did Leonard Malton over at USC in a class that I took back in the day when I was there, except it was with Ar Arthur Knight. And a young girl came up to the mic at one point and she said, I don't understand how you were able to cut those, those action scenes. How did you get through that footage? And I said to her, I said, you know, it can feel overwhelming. Absolutely. You know, a drama scene can feel overwhelming. But what I found is, is that knowing that I've done it before, but also knowing that all I need to do is begin. And it doesn't have to mean beginning at the beginning. It doesn't mean having, you can begin at the end. You can begin in the middle. Just start somewhere. And knowing that I can do that and that I'll figure it out. There's an empowerment in that. And there's also an empowerment in knowing that for a certain period of my career, no matter whether I worked with Gina or worked with Casey or, or Catherine Hardwick or, or any, any of the directors I've been able to work with, there's still that kind of process where you still have to start all over again when you're going into another project and you have to prove to people again that you're capable of doing this or that you could do this film. And I'm not going to say that that's going to go away after The Woman King, but for my own internal self, it's like, I got this, you know, and I can't wait to see what's next. And I know that whatever that is, I'm going to go in with the same self that I'm coming out of this one. In. And I know it doesn't quite answer your question, but I, I feel like with this film, there was this sense of at times maybe it wanting to lean more towards the action element of the genre and maybe a little bit away from some of the layers that to me are what make the film special. And what I know is, is that Gina and I standing firm with knowing what this film is and what it should be and what we th think the audience is really going to appreciate about why this film is different and just staying true to that is why I believe this film is, is, is connecting with people on such a level. So I, I take away that we knew if we stayed true to what her intention was, the film would do well, and it has. And that's a good thing to come away with. It certainly is. In fact, in my experience, the best answers are the ones that don't actually answer my questions. So I feel like if I say another word, I'm just going to ruin things. So maybe we should just end it right here. <laughs> You know, I tend to ramble. I sometimes feel like I need an editor, but that's going to be you. I'm no Terrell in Shropshire, but I'll do what I can. Okay. Make me sound good, Matt. You already did that. Thank you. No help from me needed. Terry always sounds great. She always edits great because she's a great editor, and I'm very happy we got to spend some time with her today. If you have not seen it yet, go check out The Woman King and see all the fantastic work Terry and her filmmaking friends did to tell that story. When it is time for you to tell your story, well, tell it well. And like Terry says, trust your audience. There's very little that's more important in telling a great story than to trust your audience. Of course, a close second to that is to trust your editing to Avid Media Composer. No, it won't do it for you, but it will help you do it with greater flexibility, stability, and probably a few other illities that I can't think of. So please do us both a favor and check out all the latest with Avid's flagship nonlinear editing system. You can do that over on avid.com, and I put a link in the show notes to speed you on your way. As for me, I'm on my way out of here. Thank you for hanging out with me and Terry today to talk editing. Let's do that again sometime. Until then, this is Matt Fury, and I am looking forward to the next time we get together right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>